Vespasian networks. And so how I want you to kind of frame this, especially again, because, oh, there's a midterm coming up, right? We are essentially wrapping up the logic section. And Bayesian networks is actually going to serve as sort of our shift away from logic into machine learning. Because as we'll see in just a second, this was what we considered machine learning before like the neural network took over, right, uh, and became the, the default standard. So in essence, it's now... You know, we synthesized, we did all this logic, and then, you know, uh, on Monday we talked about this idea that, oh, well, now we have uncertainty and we're, we're modeling maybe probabilities. Oh, well, you know, because we're modeling probabilities, this is where we, we keep on asking more questions, right? One of the key things that we focused in on on Monday was independent variables, right? Dice roll that aren't going to impact another die. But what happens when variables or, you know, our, our outcomes do impact each other? That's essentially where this Bayesian network comes in. So again, if we do a little bit of a refresher, right, we had this idea of the joint probability distribution table. That was added in or introduced on Monday's class where, again, you can see what Every mapping to our variable, we have the true false values. We have some probability that these, all of these variables occur at this configuration, this percentage of the time. The big issue, though, was what happens as we begin to add additional variables, right? Because that's the two to the power of n problem. Every new variable, well, that becomes two new possible configurations, for that, and we have to start modeling. And so that becomes a major pain point, again, in logic, in everything that we were dealing with. But just because it's a pain point doesn't mean we throw it away entirely. We can find ways to utilize this. And specifically, this is where, like I was saying, what happens when those variables start to have an influence over each other, right? A, for example, right now is independent of B, independent of C, independent of D. But what happens if, you know, the likelihood of A being true has a very direct, you know, correlation to the value of what B would be? Uh, a good example that we'll see later on is, well, if it's cloudy, there's going to be a higher chance of rain than when it's sunny, Right? That, that kind of straightforward. And so that same kind of approach is coming in. The variable there of is cloudy, right, may be impacting the, you know, wet grass or rain condition uh, going on. So it starts to become a little bit of something that we could utilize as we're working through these algorithms to help sort of challenge, or not challenge, help reduce this number down. That again, just because it's a big number doesn't mean... We don't do it, it's can we shrink it? What methodology can we do to condense it? So again, we start to get back to that analogy of, or not analogy, that idea of what we called conditional probability. I have something, right? What is the probability of some occurrence occurring given some evidence, right? I see stuff. I have observed this thing. I observe that the sky is cloudy. I observe that a patient comes in with a toothache. I observe that I stepped on a crack. Then what I'm asking, okay, well, based on this observed evidence, what's the probability of something happening, something occurring, right? I observed I stepped on a crack. Now, what is the probability that I broke my mother's back? Thank you. I heard a little, I heard, I heard some air exit some nose. Nostrils? Nostrils? What, my point being, right? So how do we start to play this out? Again, if we're looking at the formula, right, when we are looking at conditional probability, we make sort of our numerator,
our numerator becomes, we're going to make the assumption that everything that we're sort of asking is what it is. I don't want to say is true because you'll see, you know, it can be whatever value. It could be false. But, like, let's assume that the evidence is what we saw and the occurrence that we're seeking also happens. Like, what's the probability that that occurs? Because then what we're doing on the bottom end is just now, what's the probability of the evidence just happening? Just the evidence. You know, again, prob of evidence. That division, again, that's just a allowing us to have some ratio that we can work off of. Uh, you know, this happens 48 you know, 0.48% of the time, then the total prob is, uh, you know, 75%, right? 48 divided by 75, I have a number that I can work from. So this is where, as we start to expand, we also get some beautiful, you know, insights, right? If I'm dealing with this idea of independence, some variables may impact each other, some par uh, variables may not impact each other, right? So suddenly, you know, stepping on a crack, yes. So we all know that's just more of a, an, uh, uh, an idiom. It's not really, you know, scientifically uh, valid, uh, that I think, right? So the probability of stepping on a crack is just you stepped on that. But then there's that idea of, well, again, just like we saw with toothaches and cavities. Well, back aches probably have some uh, correlation to an actual injury occurring, right? So in that context, that probability, right, would have an influence on each other, but then those independent variables are separate. And when you would find this out in calculation, right, the probability of those things being what they are would be equal to, again, the probability of the two things that are impacting each other and the thing that is not impacting anything whatsoever. And this idea of independence, this becomes a very powerful tool for us when it comes to sort of this uh, AI approach to getting answers, right? Which variables are independent? Which variables are independent of what other variable? Because if we can figure that out, we can do division. If we can do division, we can at least have some degree of belief, or our agents can have some degree of belief. So, again, as we're kind of looking at this from this independence context for a second, right, the idea becomes that for two variables, just two variables to be considered independent of each other, the probability of like A and B, let's assume A and B are independent. They do not impact each other. Okay, fine. What that would turn into is A times, or the probability of A times the probability of B. That would just be the end result. Well, what that would tell us then is that if A and B are independent of each other, the probability of A, given what we see with B, right? Given that we observe B, what's the probability of A happening? Essentially, it would be the exact same as just assuming A happened at all, right? Again, think about it like a little, you know, play a little division here for a second. If I'm assuming the probability of B, and again, I'm making the assumption if these two things are independent of each other, we would just be multiplying the probabilities of that variable by itself. It's division. Those two, you know, Bs cancel each other out. And so, again, what you would see is probability of A would just be what our end game resulted. Then the same thing would happen if you were to flip the roles. What's the probability of A, or sorry, what's the probability of B happening given I observed A? Well, again, if B and A do not influence each other, then it doesn't matter that I observed A, right? It doesn't matter that I stepped on a crack. The probability of a backache is going to be the same no matter what, you know. So that's where that kind of comes in. This is just me saying those things, uh, flipping it over as well. That allows us, again, as we continue to expand our variables. Well, what does that mean? 
Well, it's really just tackling the same thing. We, we just now are acknowledging that we have another variable that we're working with, right? The probability of A and B, you know, as our assumption, given we observe C, just turns out to be the probability of A given C times the probability of B given C, right? All of those calculations would turn out to be the same thing. What that allows for, right, is this idea that now maybe I can do some reduction, right? Two to the power of n for every variable we add in that joint probability table. But if this is going to be independent because A and B don't influence each other, I'm reducing the number of lookups I have to do. I'm reducing the number of calculations I have to do. I'm condensing. I'm making my algorithm more efficient. And that's where we introduce the thing known as the Bayesian network. Now, again, we now exist in the chat GPT era, right? It's, it's awake, I guess. It's here now, right? And how does chat GPT, what's it built? We'll talk about that, but it's just a neural network, big giant neural network. Neural networks really sort of took over, honestly, about 15 years ago, right? I went to grad school in 2009, we didn't study that, right? That was, I studied pattern recognition. I studied dimension. Neural network was just not, it was just a, another algorithm, right? It, it was invented in the 60s, but like it really hadn't taken off yet. Where we saw a lot of our research from the AI field was in the Bayesian network. Specifically, you can see, right, just as the social media era was kicking in, like, that's when Bayesian networks sort of fell out of popularity. It's not that they're bad or, you know, anything. It's just, like, different uh, research interests kicked in. But what this allows for is, again, a number of different applications, right? I'm able to do spam filtering with Bayesian networks because it's just a probability. Well, what's the probability that an email is spam? Speech recognition, what's the probability that a series of uh, uh, um, numbers that have been translated from a uh, microphone uh, mean the word hello. Robotics, again, you can see we have tons of applications for it. So how does it start to pan out? All right, well, again, I mentioned that sometimes variables have influence, but then sometimes variables do not have influence. An example uh, that I, I've used in the past um, it does get a little overly complicated, and I've shared it with y'all, is this idea of like, oh, well, what happens if you're trying to do some diagnostics of like uh, someone potentially having cancer, uh, and you know or observe their smoking status, but you also have things like an x-ray. You notice that this graph structure here has a lot of moving parts, right? Smoking has a very strong correlation to you having lung cancer. Having lung cancer has a strong correlation to you having a, you know, an anomaly in an x-ray uh, or shortness of breath. Uh, so in that same kind of sense, where are you, right? We start with that idea of, oh, some variables that do have influence over others, maybe our x, and that variable also has influence on its own other variables, you know, C1 and C2, child one, child two. X in this you know, example also has influence on what the value of C1, C2 would be. But you notice that I also have something called a non-descendant, right? Non-descendant here may have influence on some of those other you know, variables, but based on what we call the Markov condition, right? This idea that I'm now only going to worry about what impacts my variable, that x. So in this case, being non-determinate, yes, it is a variable. Oh, it's in the joint probability distribution table. But from a mathematical perspective, I don't need to worry about it. But I do, you know, again, when I'm dealing with C1, I would potentially need to worry about that one. This gets into a big old process. Again, we can use uh, the naive Bayes formula, or not naive, uh, the Bayesian network formula that given any probability that I'm asking for, 
It doesn't matter what it is. Given any probability that I'm asking for, here is the formula of what I need to worry about. Now, we've got the wonderful, I have no idea what this term is referred to as. We all know what it asks for, right, though, please? It's the, you would, thank you, multiplication, right? Sigma for some, that one I really should learn. Someone figure it out for me and then remind me, right? I'm multiplying all of the probabilities of a value being whatever I asked, given only what its parents are, only what its parents are. Now I don't need to worry about, you know, in different variables. I only need to worry about my parents. My variable only needs to worry about its parents. So how we start to form out that, that, that Bayesian network, it's a DAG structure. Again, welcome back to 316. You learned about DAG structures. You were terrified by them. No, no, maybe, you know, at this point. But all it means is that we're trying to avoid some cyclical, you know, loops, right? Something shouldn't have an influence on itself that, that kind of would defeat the purpose. But again, if it has this DAG structure, right, then it should all flow downward. It should flow to a single point. Each node has its own variables. Each node has its own parents, potentially. And then what we're essentially saying in the DAG structure is that any parent is going to have influence or direct influence over its children, right? This uh, B has some influence or is correlated with C in some way. So again, as we start to think about this, right, as we build out uh, some DAG structures, right, oh, well, to have an injury may impact your back. It may impact knee uh, aches, right, because if you have an injury, that can mess up your gait. And so as you walk over the span of like 15 years, right, if you walk heavily leaning onto the right side, you're going to cause a lot of hip problems on the right side, right, it's a lot of issues. But, again, because stepping on a crack is independent, right, then when it comes to building out the DAG structure, notice there's nothing, it's not influencing anything. There's no arrows, there's no relation to this variables. So, again, I don't need to worry about it, even though I have it logged in and stored and it's in the big table. When I start to look at these things, I don't need to worry about that. So we'll start with this idea of just a simple A influences B structure. Now, one of the things that you're going to notice is that when we're presenting this, we don't use the joint probability table. It's not that it's, we'll, we'll see it in a second, but right, when I look at this, I only care about my parents. A, for example, has no parents. I only worry about it from just that holistic, what's the probability A, it, you know, is true or false? And so, I, okay, A is true 40% of the time, false 60% of the time. Cool, right? But then you can see that, oh, when I start to look at that probability of B, right, what's the probability B is true given the fact that it, has, it is influenced by A, right? Again, whatever A's value is, that's going to have a direct correlation to whatever B's value will be. Oh, well, in that case, again, we have that mapping, right? Oh, the probability of B being true, given A was true, 30%. The probability B being F, given A was true, 70%. And you notice this is where it gets a little different, right? It's not that it adds up to 1. It's now that it adds up to some value based on how many parents we're also having to categorize, right? I have to consider the value of one parent. So it's not just, uh, uh, what am I looking for? The sum of one becomes the sum of two. Right? Okay, fine, fair, okay, right? I haven't done anything wild quite yet, right? But let's expand it. Now let's take it to that full DAG-like structure. Remember, I said with the Markov process, to find the probability of something, 
I only need to worry about the parents of that thing. Right? So when I start looking at these new variables, C and D, right? I don't care about my ancestors. I don't care that A, right, also has an influence over me, right? The only thing I care about is B, my parent. C only cares about B, and D only cares about B. Okay, now we're starting to see, and you see that they each have their own mappings going on here. Again, it's, they should, it's the combination. This is where I'm, I'm looking at what I said in my own slides, and I might want to rephrase it. Uh, you know, again, because I'm dealing with a parent, right, I'm now having to deal with more than one value. That, that true-false pair with its parent at that, at that specific value, or that particular value is now the one. A better way to think about this, right, is if you were to take and map that entire thing out, right? You take every combination of your true false values and you start to map it out again, just because. And you already, uh, just going to throw that out there for you. Look at where we're going. There you are. Right? Well, I can't. I got to make uh, I haven't built your, uh, your you know, final exam yet, but I just want to make sure. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. What the hell? I'll just show you. I, I have no idea why it's doing this. Uh, it has something to do with like that. No. Nope. Okay, well, I'm not going to be able to show you the example that I wanted to show you because uh, freaking Excel. Thanks, Microsoft. Let's see if Google's any better than Microsoft. I guess this is where we all buy apples now. I'm going to keep on going. <laughs> my point being, if my Excel spreadsheet was supposed to work, I will say it does work on my own personal machine, right? Again, what you would see is, oh, if I were to take all those po possible probabilities and do just the math by itself, right, just do all the calculations, you'd see that it still eventually just results in the full sum of a one. Right? That's, that's perfectly fine. But if you notice, as we start to kind of get into this idea of dealing with conditional probability, right? Oh, if I were to only look at when A is true, right? What's the probability of, uh, you know, given that A is true, what's the probability that B would be true? Okay, well, what would I be doing? I would... Start by looking at, well, when, when are they both true, right? Okay, and I'm just doing some filtering on that joint probability table, but you could see, oh, well, you know, with the C and D, yes, technically that's happening. I'm just, I don't technically care about it because I have my lookup, right? And that is from the fact that if I were to also factor in those variables that are not influencing me and do the summation, right, I'd get a 0.12. Well, again, notice our formula, right? That's just assuming the top. If I assume just A, again, we had that as well, right? Probability of A being true is 40%. You were to take that and just look at all the possible combinations of A based on, you know, again, whatever the fact, what it doesn't matter, right? Boop. You add them all up, they would be. 40%. And so what you would see is, oh, well, the probability of B being true, given A was true, again, there's our formula, there's us plugging in our numbers, it would generate a 0 0.3. Wouldn't you know it? That's what's in the table, 
right? So again, it, it's, you know, I am, I'm able to do these calculations without it, right? That's, that's exactly what I'm seeing. So as we're starting to look at it, let's arbitrarily ask one of those questions. Now, what is the probability of everything? Again, well, let's start with just more simple cases. What's the probability uh, of A being false, B being true, C being false, D being true? Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, I'll go with you. What is the probability of not A? Not A, B, not C, D. Okay, well, again, when we're dealing with each one of those variables, yes, we've listed it out as we have, but if I'm only given this amount of data, right, well, then what I can worry about is say, hey, well, that really just me boils down to, hey, what's the probability of alpha, or not alpha, A, not being true, then what's the probability of B, ugh, why do I, B, not beta, B, given not A, times what's the probability of not C, given B, times what's the probability of D, given B. Ah. Well, again, I have these. These are in my individual lookup tables, right? A is 40. Uh, that would be 0.4 times. What's the probability of B not A? B not A, that's 0 0.99 times not C, not C, uh, times B, that's a 0 0.05 times... DB, uh, 0.1. And yeah, congratulations. That's exactly what my mapped out comes to. Boom. You, you plug, that, plug in the, boom. 0 0.00297. No one's amazed. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on. Since you didn't have any amazement, I guess it's time for you to do a few of them. I know. Uh, we will come back. Um, I'll give you, these aren't terrible, but they do take time. Uh, we'll come back at 3.37. 3.37. So I'm giving you seven minutes. And we are back. Let me see how you did. That's the wrong file. You're here. All righty. Ha-ha. Ha-ha. All right. Hello to the three of you in the web uh, stream. Uh, it's looking good. Again, you know, for the most part, you got it. Uh, you know, again, double check, again, uh, what you're looking at uh, on that side of things. Most part, it's, it, it's looking a lot more like just formatting differences, which is fine uh, there. Uh -huh. Every, okay, so for the most part, yeah, you're getting it, you're getting it, you're getting it, nice, nice. So when we start to ask that question of like, uh, let's see, A, B, true, or A false, B, or A true, B false, C true, D true, right? We're starting to get a lot of different numbers here, uh, but there's what you were supposed to look for. So double check your math, right? Again, this is I, that idea of what, uh, you know, make sure to kind of reevaluate kind of what you're, you're coming in with. Um, where's that? Did I not have the A false everything else true one? I didn't ask that one? I put it on my thing. It's right there. All right. Oh, fine. I will do this one for you. I've already done it uh, up to the, the point of, you know, you're, you're ready to pop in your calculator. Again, strong reminder, bring a calculator next week, make your rentings. 
right? So 0 0.6 times 0 0.99 times 0 0.95 times 0 0.1. So the probability of A being false but everything else being true in this case is 0 0.05643. Thank you. Thank you, golf clap. <laughs> right? No, okay, well, well, we'll come back to that in a little bit because obviously, you know, that didn't really give you much, right? I get that, right? But why we do this? Why, why was this so important? Well, again, I want you to think about the idea of four random variables. Just uh, I have some variable C, some variable S, some variable R, some variable W, right? It's cloudy, sprinklers are on, or it's raining, right? You shouldn't have your sprinklers running if it's raining. Um, so again, what's the probability of like your grass being wet or there being, uh, 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 you know, just wet conditions? Well, the problem is, specifically when we're thinking about this from trying to evaluate your answer, right? What you ended up doing. Well, again, if you were to look at the probabilities, if all of these were, again, uh, independent of each other, right? The probability of C, R, S, R, and W being whatever they are means that I would have some probability of C with the probability of, uh, of S given that I observed C with the probability of R given that I have observed C and I observed S times the probability of W given that I observed C and observed that. And we just have so many freaking problems. It becomes a very big number of calculations that we end up having to do. Uh, two to the n power or minus one. Uh, and that, again, doesn't sound like a lot when I show you something like 15, but again, thinking about that as we grow, as we have additional variables, 25 variables, right? That becomes a big major problem. But what happens if we did give it that DAG structure? We have that, we, we, we are representing that, uh, that influence that Cloudy would have on sprinkler systems or on rain, right? More likely to rain if you are cloudy. More likely your sprinklers are off if it is cloudy because, for, because of the chance of rain, right? And for those of you who are very into uh, uh, irrigation systems, like some guy, uh, I'm not into them, I just did them for way too long, uh, right? Mold gets produced if you don't, if the water, you know, you turn on the sprinkler system and you, you spray the, the ground, you know, if there's no sun out to evaporate the, the moisture, mold forms. And you have a moldy lawn. Nobody wants a moldy lawn. Although it is Halloween season, I get it, right? You don't want to real. My point being, right, is the grass wet? That's my so again, when we think about the Bayesian network, instead of it being two to the power of n minus one, this giant exponential problem, instead it only becomes n times two to the power of k. N, how many nodes do I have? K, how many parent nodes? What's the maximum number of parent nodes that I may be dealing with, right? Wet grass has two parent nodes, right? Again, just which node has the most number of parents? That's your K. That's it, right? And so as a consequence, right, now as I'm working through it, now as I look at that formula, I still have to deal with, you know, uh, P to the power of C, or uh, probability of C. I still have to do the probability of S observe, uh, given I know C, I have to do the probability of R given I know C. But when it comes to wet grass, I don't need to know or worry about cloudy anymore. I don't need to worry about it. I can only worry about my parents. And as a consequence, that 15 just became a nine. I know again, we're, you know, small numbers being compared to small numbers doesn't sound like a big deal, but Grow that to scale. Uh -huh. Grow that to scale, right? Let's arbitrarily say I had 200 parameters now, right? Now we're uh, playing in the, uh, the space of like, I don't know, medical diagnostices, right? I got so many different variables floating around in this thing, right? It's terrifying. And if I have to map out every single one of them and check every possibility, right, that's two to the power of 200 minus one which when I plugged into uh, Python gave a really big number that I 
did not want to somehow try and write on this, on my PowerPoint, right? Look at that, 1.6 times 10 to the 60, right? Just a big number of possible things I got to count, right? Not good, not easy. However, in the Bayesian network, if I still am working off of that idea that I have 200 variables, but I just arbitrarily picked a number here, let's arbitrarily say that the most any one of those nodes had was five parents, five things directly influencing it, then it would be 200 times two to the fifth power. And I would only need, instead of some number I don't even know the correct counting terminology for, 6,400, much smaller. Even, again, even if I increase this, again, I'm not going to need to increase it by a lot, but again, you know, I, if I have a small enough uh, uh, K value, we can very clearly see one's going to be much more efficient in calculation than the other, and that's, again, that important part. Um, mm -hmm. So... This is where, yeah, I did that calculation, I plugged it in, we got our value, but that's just a small piece of the puzzle, right? That's just one value. That didn't really help, right? It didn't really help answer any questions. Just what's the probability of all that? Okay, is that, is that uh, low probability chance of happening. So now what if I only have a certain amount of them? Some of these become more hidden variables. We'll start to see this crop up a few times later on um, as I'm, I didn't, I don't have it up anymore, but I showed, oh, here, right? I have things that are not necessarily observable, right? I have potential variables that are quite intrusive if I were to try and do them. Right. Oh, let's see if you have tuberculosis. Well, that's a costly surgery or a biopsy, very intrusive uh, kind of thing. Has lung cancer. Again, very intrusive. Has bronchitis. Very intrusive. Yes, we have tests for them, but they're expensive. But I do have things. Shortness of breath, if you don't know what dyspnea is, and smoking, right? Those are observable. I can ask my patient those, or my patient can report them, or I can see them from an x-ray, which is not an expensive uh, 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 thing. Oh, well, now, again, I have certain variables that may be hidden from me that I do not properly have values to. Now what do I deal, right? What's the probability of A being true, given I have observed C and D are true? Right now, I don't have that B formula, but how does this pan out? Well, again, we're still working off of conditional probability. What do we do? We assume the top, and we assume, or sorry, we assume uh, uh, the assumption is true, and our evidence is true, or our uh, uh, our assumption and evidence are the values that we are looking to evaluate over just. How likely is the evidence, the observed, you know, evidence, those values? And so, yes, even as we start to pan this out, that's what we would end up doing. We assume A is true, C is true, and D is true. That becomes our numerator. We assume, or uh, then we just look at the probability of C and D being the values that we've presented. Okay, well, again, we're just handling the calculations. So... For my sake, this is, I'm going to just use my slides here then, rather than embarrass myself with trying to like do that. So, but okay, I'm going to tackle my denominator first. Why? Because it, that gives me all the calculations and then I can just plug and play, right? Well, again, what that would look like is then I'm looking at, well, what's the probability of those variables that I'm not dealing with, right? Yes, B is hidden. Hidden is more in the sense of, like, I don't have a, a clear way of getting that from evidence. And I don't care about, you know, again, I'm looking at the probabilities of A. So I start mapping it out. Well, then notice what I've essentially done. How I like to kind of remind students, because you'll notice soon that you have a lot of these to calculate, just FYI. Right? 
one thing that I would recommend, here's how I kind of view it, right? Okay, given that I have the probability of something, right? I have the probability of two values, which means that I have, the prob uh, I have two to the power of two things that I need to be working from. Or, uh, let me, hold on, let me frame that. How many variables do I have? Let me start there. How many variables do I have? Four. Thank you. Right. I have four total variables. N equals four. Okay, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, let's do two N minus evidence. Number of evidence that I'm working off of. Okay, well, again, I have four variables. Minus I have two variables I'm working off of in evidence. That becomes two to the power of two. That means I'm going to need to evaluate four statements. Why I present this is you'll notice how I designed this out. I wrote this out in a very specific format, mostly because as I do these calculations for y'all, right, I like to use binary to remind myself the order or what values I have not calculated yet, right? I have a C and D. Or rather, let me, those are going to be consistent, right? They're not going to change, right? Because I have observed them. They are facts. But I have two out there I have not addressed, aka I'm going to have four calculations. I'm going to need to work off of that idea of binary for a second. And I like to, I kind of work off of, since I, I start with sort of the true trues, yes, this is where we're, I'm doing the opposite of what you would normally do, where it's start counting at zero. I sort of am counting down, right? I think one, 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 zero, zero, one, zero, zero. That right, Herf? Right. Okay, well, as I plug those in, right, okay, where I see the ones, those become my true statements. Where I see the zeros, those are where my false statements are. And in essence, I've mapped out all of those same things that I have up there with A being, you know, positive, the true value, and then A not being, and then Bs. Notice how it's alternating. This helps with my organization, but why I mention this and why I'm stressing it is because, again, this is one of those ones I know that points get deducted from. Do it slow, right? Don't try and do it all in your head. I, I, I warn y'all every, every semester, don't do it. And you, you try and do it. You try and prove me wrong. I'm not there yet, because I'm not there yet. My point being, either way, right? Okay, fine. You plug all those in. Well, again, we are working off of the Markov process. I only need to worry about for any given variable, I only need to worry about its parent. So I start mapping those out, right? The out, uh, probability of A times probability of B given I've seen A. Probability of C given B. Probability of D given B. Now the probability of A, probability of not B given A. The probability of C given, excuse me, not B. The probability of D given not B. I map out every single one of them. Again, this is my way of like starting to try and build these out as I work through them because, again, I'm looking for ways to kind of make my job. Uh, if I can't automate it, I'll try and make it repetitive because then I can just get into a nice little flow and do the calculations and knock them all out. So, again, as I start to map them out, right, I, now I'm doing my lookups, right? I'm, I'm swapping out and finding where those values are, exactly what they are. And each one builds out their own calculations. Then I've got a bunch of numbers that I have thrown out in space, right? But what do I do with them? <laughs> Notice what was also hiding in the background there, the plus sign. The probability of C and D being true is essentially the summation of all the other possible situations that are not being observed 
added together. So that 0 0.01 plus that 0 0.16 plus that 0 0.05 plus that 0 0.003, all of those are being added together. And that produces, oh, the probability of C being true, D being true, 23, 23.59% uh, you know, or whatever. Okay, well, again, since I've tackled my denominator, it's time to tackle the numerator. And here's, again, pick which side works for you better, right? Tackling the numerator first or tackling the denominator first, right? Whichever one works in your brain as the easier way, right? If you do the numerator first, you've solved some of your calculations already. If you do the denominator first, you've done all your calculations already, and then you're just doing a lookup to the next one. Uh, but again, if you see, right, oh, I'm just now working off of my assumption. So that assumption only needs, again, I'm assuming that the assumption is true, right? The A is a true value. So now, the only thing I have to factor in, right, if I were to go and play my calculation game again, right? I have, now it's more air quoted E. I have three variables that I'm working off of, but I had a max of four. And so, oh, I only need to do two calculations, right? That's, that's more of a check, a sanity check for you when you're building these out, did you do them right? Uh, so again, okay, well, we map them out. We throw the calculations out. Again, we've already done them, so there they are. We take them, we add them, ha-cha-cha-cha. -cha -cha. Yes? So, yeah, well, it's not that we were given, it's what we're asking in our original question. What's the probability that A is true given we've observed it? So, right, yay. So we just figured out, well, what's the probability C and D just happen? Now, let's assume A happens, as we're, we're sort of asking the question, let's assume it does that. What's the probability that that happens itself? Again, that gets plugged in, and you notice, again, what I've got formed, let me pick a different color, blue, why not, is I have my assumption, I have my evidence, and I would have now a simple ratio. 17, do I need to round up? I'll just go three digits. 17, and then 0 0.2, 3.6. Oh, look at that. That's just division. Once again, that just becomes a little bit of ugly decimal division. 0 0.176 divided by 0 0.236. And so the probability of A being true, given that we have observed C and D being true, is 75%. Or 74, you know, going on there, right? Oh, look at that. Now, again, as we're starting to think about this, right, think about what that, that example I keep pulling up, right, that idea of, like, could I now make an assessment of, well, given the observations that I have seen uh, from our patient and their medical, you know, uh, results, what's the probability of something like lung cancer? Oh, okay, well, again, that's expensive to test, so we're not just going to arbitrarily throw it out there. But we got a high value of probability that given what we saw, we assume, right, whatever, 74%. Oh, okay, then maybe we should do the test to confirm it. So this is where uh, I got plenty of time. Um, I don't really have this one for you as like uh, a separate worksheet. But what we'll do is we'll just kind of work through this together. So. <laughs> we want to find out what's the probability that it is cloudy given that I look down and the grass is wet. And I look down, it's wet. I could look up, but again, that's very computationally expensive. And 
you know, this is how my body looks these days. My point being, <laughs> what are we going to tackle? Again, what we start with, the probability of W. I'll, start, I'll just work through just like we did in sort of the class. What is the probability of W, right? Our observed evidence happening. Okay, well, again, that means that we have to map out a lot of different things because the probability of W is dependent on its parents. And we also showed that it, we only need to worry about the multiplication of its parents. So in that case, we would say, okay, I need to worry about the probability of, uh, hold on, let me think about this. The probability of S given W times the probability of R given W plus probability of S given W times the probability of not R given W plus probability of not S given W times the probability of R given W plus the probability of S or not S W times the probability of not R W. So again, positive, 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 negative, negative, positive, negative, negative, right? Again, the true false tables formulating here. Okay, fine. Then this is where, again, it's some nice, simple lookups, which I'll swap colors for. So I tackle the next little problem here. Uh, let's see, what's the probability of S being true given W is true? Uh, that's at the bottom this time because that's how I wanted to work. So you can see this is where we get into some slight issues, right? Well, not slight issues because you see I'm working off of both of them, right? Uh, so I actually formed this slightly wrong. I apologize. Let me fix that. I'm about to do the same thing. I just did it slightly wrong, right? It becomes what is the probability of W given S R plus what is the probability of W W W uh, S not R plus not S R plus not S not R. Okay, again, that one pulls out and becomes where are we? Probability of W. Probability of W. Eh. Uh, both of them being true, 99%. Then W being true and R not being true, so it's 0 0.9. And 0 0.9. Then just a flat out 1. I take these all up. And I know that I should be able to, I know it's, a, it's close to 4, but I'm not going to do that. There. Why did I do something wrong here? Zero. It should be zero. That didn't really help my problem, though. What did I do wrong here? Oh, uh -huh. well, I, you know, I, I'm now worried about time, and so. So I make the assumption that W is true. Well, so now it's just when is W true? That means I'm. So, oh, okay, right, right, right. So that means I'm looking for whenever W was true. So I'm adding them together. <laughs> w is true given that. So, hmm. Okay. Now. I work off of my C. Sorry, I'm, I'm working in my own brain now, and this is where I have an audience staring at me. And it's terrifying. Um, I want to say I'm doing these right. If I'm not, I will double check and correct. I apologize if I'm lying to you in front of your face. My point being is, okay, I've got my W. Now let's worry about my C, right? my, my C being true. Uh, what am I 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. So now uh, let's worry about C and W being true. Okay, well, in this type of situation, we're still sort of handling this whole process again because I'm now dealing with two things. C is still happening, right? It's still being true. We are now making that assumption that it is true. Uh, from here, oh, okay, I think I know where I went wrong. I don't think I have enough time for this now that I'm like talking it out in my head and realizing what I did here. I don't have enough time to do this in class. One, this is all wrong. Two, I got like 10 minutes to essentially do a lot of calculations. So here's what I'm going to do instead. I apologize. Again, this is where it would have helped if I had notes, right? Um, kept my notes with me instead of told you to do a group exercise. My point being, uh, so what I will do, I will do the calculations. I will post them to Piazza. Uh, and I'm going to now just like ramble for a second and, you know, someone dangle their keys in front of everybody as a distraction for me. Just thank you. Thank you. Keep doing it. I am a puppet master. Uh, is You have to understand, uh, I'm quite good with controlling the use. You can stop with the keys. You can stop with the keys. Okay. All right. Never mind. I don't have to uh, post it to Piazza. Uh, I'll still post it to Piazza. I think, thankfully, I have done this calculation in the past. Uh, but this is exactly what I was saying. It would have been way too long for me to try and do it um, on the board. So rather than me stumbling through and then just embarrassing myself, I'm going to cheat and say that I did this years ago. And there, right? So if you're starting to map out, right, again, if I'm trying to find out this, uh, this probability, right, mm -hmm of C being true and W being true, right? Again, I map out that probability. Okay, well, again, if I was to look at this, I could map out that's where my mistake happened. So use this as a learning opportunity of what, where I screwed up. It's not that you immediately jump into just doing your probability of W, right? That was where I messed up, and I'd have to have fixed that. Still map it out as is, right? Still take all your variables and give them their own configurations, right? You're not going to do all of those, but you can see that you do pass it through, right? Then you translate it. So the probability of C being true, S being true, R being true, W being true. Um, I'm working off of the numerator here because you can see it's a lot of calculations, right? So mapped out all of them being true. That would imply the probability of C being true times the probability of S being true, given C is true, times the probability of R being true, given C is true, times the probability of W being true, given S and R are true. You plug those values in, you'd see you'd be getting a 0 0.5, a 0 0.1, a 0 0.8, and a 0 0.99. I do that with all of them. I do the same plug-in, I do the same process, and here's where I would add in my digits. So again, this is maybe some tips for you as you know you will be doing this on a final exam. You will be doing this on a final exam, right? So I kind of work off of my numerator first. Why? Because I knock out calculations early, right? And I only had to do the calculations once. And now I have half of the calculations done. Then I have to worry about the rest of the probabilities, the rest, you know, the probability of W. I already, this is my assumption. I did the assumption first. I heard a sound. Oh. It sounded like a um. I goes, what did I do wrong? <laughs> did I offend? Anyways, anyways. Uh, so when I sum up my numerator, I end up with the value of 0 0.3726. So again, that's the probability of C being true given W being true. Or sorry, that's C being true and W being true. 
then I'm looking at, well, then just what's the probability that W is true only? And again, as you can see, what I end up doing here is now I'm uh, effectively I'm working through the rest, right? C being false, C being false, C being false, C being false. Map out the rest of these. In fact, I am cheating. This is, this is where I'm not using the binary system that I just taught you, right? I know, but it, you know, I'm kind of still doing it. I just am treating that since it's a constant value, it's not gonna be something that needs to flip. But true, 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 false, false, true, false, false. Map those out again, I get my value. I get my value. I get my value. I get nothing here. Why do I get nothing here? Huh? It's zero. In my, if we, if you uh, look again at the calculation, right, if I'm dealing with zeros, multiplying anything by zero wipes it out. It's just not going to happen. So now that I've done that, I take and add them together, right? So I'm now left with 0 0.6, 4, 7, 1. I take those values, right? I take those values, I plug them in, and so now the probability that it is cloudy, given the fact that my grass is wet, and that's the only thing I can look at, 57% chance of clouds. Yes? So, deal with the true value of C for that second set of calculations? Because I've already done it. Right. And so, like, here's kind of where if I were to, like, how I'm getting the 67 is I took the number that I've already calculated plus 0 0.4 plus 1.8 plus 0 0.4 or 0 0.04. So it's, it's more of a, like, here's ha the halfway mark, finished the rest of it added those in, so that's kind of where that's coming in. I don't need to do it again because I've already done it once. Yeah, other questions? All right, well again, I will, I, I think I have uh, like a PDF of this. I will go ahead, and, I'm, not, I'm not done, I'm not done. Right. I have, I think, a PDF of this, um, uh, and I'll, so of this slide, so I, or this sheet of paper right here. So I will uh, try and find it, and I'll, I'll put it on Moodle, so that way you can just like have direct access to this, and like maybe plug and play, change the values. Where I, I since I have a little bit of time left, uh, specifically, one thing I also included in Moodle for you is uh, I used to also cover sort of like the next lecture that I used to cover is called deseparation because how do you determine when something's independent or not, right? Right now, I, I gave you a, a DAG that is pretty straightforward. Everything influences, you know, at some kind of category, right? But what happens when you get into a much more ugly situation like this where you have it would help if I was on the right. right. There, here's the slide. I removed deseparation so that I could teach you principal component analysis. Deseparation is more of a continuation of Bayesian networks. So like if you're really interested in the Bayesian network uh, from a historical standpoint or you want to use it to solve the world, right? feel free to read through it. But specifically, again, it's much more complicated because notice not everything impacts other things, right? Or it, it, it's still a DAG, but like it has things that are